There are so many sermons in our gospel lesson today. (laughs) For any of you that feel like I might go on a little too long, um, I can assure you I could go on longer. (laughs) There were like four, even while I was reading the gospel a moment ago, I thought, oh gosh, I could have worked with that instead of what I chose. (laughs) Or maybe what chose me, I don't know. But I'm struck with this line in our gospel right at the end. When Jesus says, or the landowner says, in Jesus' story, are you envious because I'm generous? Envy is something we know we should not be. Brene Brown, in her book, Atlas of the Heart, defines envy as that which occurs when we want something another person has. It's on a long list of things we're not supposed to do in the scriptures along with things like licentiousness and fornication and adultery and stealing. And so it's odd here in this last question of this story. Are you envious because I'm generous? It can occur, if we're honest with ourselves, that we are envious of God's generosity. It's something that surprises us because even the most noble and most dedicated follower of Jesus can be caught off guard by this, as is made evident in both our Old Testament and New Testament gospel lesson. We wonder, though, who can be envious of another's generosity? I mean, what is it that trips us up that can make us envious of another's generosity? And as is made evident in both of these stories, it's the one who fails to know their own blessedness. It's the one who fails to know their own benefit of the same generosity. That's when we fall into envy. I want to start by looking at the story of Jonah. We've come here to the end. Rarely do we get to hear that part. We all remember the beginning. Jonah being sent out by God to go to Nineveh to preach to them that they need to repent and receive the salvation of God. The Ninevites were not the Hebrew people. They weren't supposed to get this message. And yet God calls Jonah to go out and deliver it. And he resists, of course, gets on a boat going in the opposite direction, only to be met by a storm. And in the discerning wisdom of all of those present on the boat, they figured somebody's angry and needs to be satisfied. Now, to Jonah's credit, he recognized that he was a problem. He knew in his heart he was running away from God. There's no doubt about it for him. He just hoped nobody else would notice. And so, as the story goes, he jumps over the boat, is swallowed by a large fish, is in the belly there for three days, and then is regurgitated onto the shore of Nineveh. This minor prophet is the only prophet read by the Jewish people on the most significant of days, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is tomorrow. The pattern of the spiritual life, as this prophet's story tells us, is that we must go down before we go up. In Christianity, we say that we are called to die to ourselves, just as Jesus did, and be raised to new life just as Jesus was. Now, none of us knows what to die to oneself means because we don't know the ways that we resist God's transforming power. And I can assure you, and if only I had somebody up here in their 80s beside me, they would second the point that there's always a chance to learn how to let it go again, deeper and more. And thus it makes good sense to read this prophet when considering our own sin, when we need to consider our own unwillingness to let God have God's way with us. Jonah is sent to to deliver God's message to people who aren't Israelites, and everyone repents. All creation repents, even the animals. In the portion before what we read here this morning, talks about Jonah going into the city going a day's walk. It was a big city. It actually would take three days to walk across. That's longer than the island of Manhattan, by the way. So he goes into the city of Nineveh, cries out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And when the news reached the king of Nineveh, 
He rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. And indeed, that's where we pick up our story this morning. Because when God saw what they did, he did indeed relent from the punishment he had planned to deliver. For he saw their willingness to respond to the graciousness of God. God demonstrates God's desire to give God's self away to all of creation in this story, even the animals, it says, so that all might be saved. And whenever this happens, I can say that it angers people time and again. Surely not those people, though, God not those people. This generosity of God bothers us. It makes us angry. We, like Jonah, want people to be in or out. We don't want to be bothered by the generosity of God. A friend of mine shared with me, um, as she's reading this book called The Great Dechurching, Who's Leaving, Why Are They Going, and What Will It Take to Bring Them Back? which is a book she doesn't recommend, by the way. But it does have some good data points. (laughs) One of which is this, that in the U.S., 40 million people have left the church in the last two decades. That's in the last 20 years. You certainly have noticed that. People who've been at St. Stephen's for longer than 20 years notice that. They remember back at the last end of the last century when there were a hundred and some kids in church school, when there was a youth group of 40 people, when there were so many folks that they considered building a building out where the garden is now. They were going to call it the West Building because we already had a North Hall, so we needed a West one. What has happened, people have asked me. Orlando Costas, in his book, The Integrity of Mission, The Inner Life and Outreach of the Church, which is a book I do recommend, says the following. Church growth is not an ultimate, it's a penultimate. This growth is to be measured not simply by the number of people entering into the church's fellowship, but especially by their participation in the bringing about of a new order, in establishing a community of love, in struggling for justice and peace as an anticipation of the ultimate revelation of God's kingdom. Orlando Costas was born in 1942 in Puerto Rico. He came to New York in the Bronx when he was about 12 years old and experienced the real prejudice against people who were from Puerto Rico. Inevitably, eventually he moved to, with his father to Bridgeport, Connecticut, just down the road. Grew up going to the Black Rock Congregation, which is still there, at least until his young adulthood. He lived a life of mission work, but called us to consider it differently. He died at only 45 years of age, and in that time wrote eight books, four in Spanish, four in English, and The Integrity of Mission is one of his English books. You can see I recommend it. Look at all my little tabs there. I got so much I can't even open the pages without them getting caught on each other. It's not a very good, efficient way to access things. But Orlando Costas, writing in 1979, concludes his book with these following words. The Christian church in the North Atlantic during the last quarter of the 20th century has been having to come to terms with the implications of the cross for its participation in God's mission. After centuries of triumphal theologies of glory, with the accent on the virtuous Lion of Judah, the victorious Lion of Judah, and the glorious visions of a mighty, all-powerful, conquering foreign missionary movement, the Western Church has been having to swallow the bitter herbs of the breaking down of Christendom, 
the resurgence of other religions and religious movements, the shutting up of many mission fields, and the feeling of inertia that has overtaken many Christians in local congregations. This book was published in 1979. I'm struck by how familiar it sounds. He goes on to say, in its crisis, in the church's crisis, a true state of spiritual agony, for we feel the pain of it, the church has begun to discover that the victorious lion is the slain lamb. The church is having to realize that its greatest glory does not lie in the marvelous works it is able to perform. It's not in the millions of dollars it is able to raise for the cause of mission, nor in the thousands of young people it is able to recruit for service in the world's remote parts, nor the fabulous reports they will be able to send back home. Rather, the church's glory will lie on the cross of Christ. Its greatest merit will be the sensitivity it is able to develop toward the leading of the Spirit, its openness to his mysterious ways. The church's greatest achievement will be marked by its ability to serve humbly in collaboration with the thousands of churches and millions of Christians whom the Holy Spirit is raising among the weak and the disenfranchised of the earth. And the Holy Spirit is doing this without fanfare, without financial resources, and without academically qualified personnel. I recognize the spiritual agony of which Orlando Costa speaks because it came to a head in 2020. That's when people wondered out loud, where is God? Where is God's victory? In the destruction of a virus, in our division of a as a nation, when our image of ourselves as the people of the United States was being torn down by history, which had then finally come to light for some of us. The question that echoed around was, why won't God act victoriously? Where is God in this? Orlando Costas reminds us that our glory, the church's glory, does not lie in the marvelous works we are able to form perform. The church's glory lies on the cross of Christ. 2020 was a year of dying, literally and figuratively. We're still coming to terms with that time. Orlando Costas says our greatest merit will be the sensitivity that we're able to develop toward the leading of the Spirit, our openness to God's mysterious ways. Our greatest achievement will be marked by our ability to serve humbly in collaboration with thousands of churches and millions of Christians whom the Holy Spirit is raising among the weak and the disenfranchised of the earth. These are people that don't have all the fanfare or financial resources or academic qualifications. So that brings us to our question here at St. Stephen's. How are we participating in bringing about the new order? How are we participating in establishing a community of love? How are we struggling for justice and peace as an anticipation of the ultimate revelation of God's kingdom, knowing that we here are the penultimate? You might think this is a tall order, these questions, a big ask of the church and maybe a big ask of you. And it is if you, if we, try to do it with our own will. But last Sunday we remembered and let us remember all the time that with God's help, we can do all things. This isn't something we made up for our baptismal covenant. It comes from the promises of scripture. In our gospel lesson today, the landowner says, are you envious because I'm generous? If we're honest, we'll say, yes, Lord, because I want your generosity. And we will hear God say, you have it. You have had it, and you will have it. Give us this day our daily bread. Your daily bread is all you need. When we take contemplative time 
to say the things out loud to God that we don't want other people to hear. We have the chance to deeply listen to God's generosity in our lives. We can pray, Lord, remove my envy. I want to participate in your generosity. I want to be a part of a community which envisions a world made whole by your transforming love and action. And the Lord says to us, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will live conscious of my generosity. And the people say, Amen. <laughs>